um, etc. So check out the website for that, as well as um, another course we're running on skin reconstruction. Lots of things going on in 2021. Naresh, you're looking good? I think I'm looking okay. Thanks a lot. All right, over to you. Okay, so actually I'm going to take my video out. You don't need to see me. So I'm going to stop my video, but just keep my uh, microphone on. So, sorry about that. Uh, good evening. Uh, so this, this is a lecture, which is, doesn't seem to be moving. Okay, so this evening, this lecture is entitled An Approach to Lower Eyelid Retraction. I suppose this is really kind of a, a personal analysis of how I try to figure out the management of lower eyelid retraction when a patient walks in presenting with that problem. So over the years, I've seen a lot of patients who have had an issue with their lower eyelid and I have just tried to analyze. Sometimes you do things without thinking. So whenever you lecture, you, you have to sit down and try to think, how am I thinking? So this is how I'm thinking when I see a patient with lower lid retraction. And as I know, this is the last of the lecture series. I want to thank everybody uh, who has helped me through to perform these operations, uh, especially all the team at uh, Chelsea and Westminster who really uh, ha have been inspirational to me over the years and have taught me so many things. So I'd like to thank all my colleagues at Chelsea and Westminster uh, on each, uh, slide you'll see some initials at the bottom i'm sorry i'm not going to stop and thank everyone who's helped me with every operation but you will see the names of people uh or their initials come up at the bottom uh, of the photographs uh, so thank you very much so this is just an analysis of how i think about lower eyelid retraction and and because i'm a simple guy i like to think in a simple way so I call it the sag and the drag principle of lower lid retraction. So a sag means that something is loose, something is not being held in position. And a drag means that something is being pulled down. So when we talk about lower eyelid retraction, we need a kind of a definition of what this is. So you can think of lower eyelid retraction as an increase in MRD2. So what is the MRD2? It is the distance in the mid, from the mid pupil to the lower eyelid in a straight line. So here's an MRD2 in this patient, and here's a, an MRD in another patient. And you will see if you compare the two, there's a difference in the MRD2 because on the lower photograph, there is lower lid retraction. You can also define it as increased scleral show. So a patient again here uh, with no evidence of scleral show, whereas the, the photograph here shows evidence of scleral show. So here we have a definition of lower lid retraction with scleral show. You can define it as millimeters of MRD1, uh, 2 or you can define it as 1 to 3 millimeters or 6 millimeters of inflar scleral show. So if we expand that classification, I like to think when a patient walks in, is this diffuse lower lid retraction or is it more focal? Is it just in one area? So you can define lower lid retraction in those terms. Is it diffuse or focal? And we'll really focus on lower lid retraction in the diffuse sense because the focal treatment of focal pathology, I think is obvious to most people. You can then subclassify lower lid retraction into pseudo lower lid retraction or true lower lid retraction. What do I mean by that? Well, then you can think of the lower lid in terms of the orbit and in terms of the mid face. So when you have a pseudo lower lid retraction, due to orbital causes, what you see is there is evidence of displacement of the lower eyelid due to the orbital contents being misaligned with the lid position. So usually it's because the orbital contents are too far forwards. So the logical treatment of this, if you're able to, is to push 
the orbital contents backwards to eliminate the lower lid retraction. So this form of orbital pseudo lower lid retraction is best managed with retroplacement of the globe structures. And so here is a patient who's had the retroplacement of the globe structures with orbital decompression and lid surgery to eliminate the lower eyelid retraction. So we've talked about true lower lid retraction. This is a term I use for those in whom the treatment really is to the globe. You can, and here's another patient with a similar case where they've had the retroplacement of the orbital contents. Now you can also have a pseudo lower lid retraction due to the mid face being usually hyperplastic, which can be congenital, or I suppose it could be acquired through trauma. So there may be lower lid retraction as a consequence of mid facial hyperplasia. And the treatment of this hyperplastic situation or retroplacement of the mid face, say in trauma, the true correction would be anteroplacement or anterior distraction of the mid facial complex. So here's a picture of a patient who's clearly undergone distraction and advancement of the total mid facial structures to eliminate that pseudo lower lid retraction. And this can also be changed, the parameters can be changed with mid facial augmentation of facial implants. So what we see is that the lower eyelid position is very intertwined with the globe and the mid facial positions. And this term, the orbital vector comes into play. So whenever you're thinking of lower eyelid retraction, you should also think of orbital vectors. And what does that mean? It's slightly confusing. Uh, I apologize for those who are very familiar with the term, but I'm just going to say it for those who, who are not so familiar. A neutral orbital vector would be that when the anterior surface of the cornea, the anterior pole is in line with the mid facial structures. Whereas a negative orbital vector is strangely when the eyeball is too protuberant or anteriorly displaced in line with the mid face. And a negative, uh, sorry, a positive vector would be when the globe is retroplaced. So it's further behind than that and therefore, you see this in enophthalmus, whether it's uh, congenital or it's acquired. So the next case is if we have a pseudo lower eyelid retraction due to globe or mid facial malposition in, in relation to the lower eyelid, what would happen if we tried to correct that by just not dealing with the, the, the orbit or the mid face? Well, this is a patient that uh, is part of the craniofacial service that we looked after who presents in old age with uh, relative intolerance due to constant dry eyes. You see how red her eyes are and clearly her lower eyelid is too far inferiorly displaced. So this is managed with uh, a, a flap from the upper lid, a bucket handle type of flap, which is about a centimeter wide and a conchal graft. Now, in this situation, the graft is, uh, is actually positioned on the orbital rim and sutured on the orbital rim and the inferior tarsal border as a strut for the lower eyelid. And she has an improvement in her lower eyelid position and a decrease in her inferior scleral show and a decrease in her MRD2. And she is better positioned in terms of the eyelid in relation to the eyeball but of course, she does not have the best aesthetic outlook. So when you have a pseudo lower eyelid retraction, or at least when you have a retraction, and you think, how am I going to lift the eyelid? You've got to think, is it the eyelid that I need to deal with? Or is it the mid face or the globe? So next time you see a lower eyelid retraction, one of the things to think about is what is the relationship of the eyelid to the globe and the mid face. Now we move on to what I would term true lower lid retraction. So this is where I bring in the principle of sag and drag. Now, 
it's just to simplify things for me because I am a simple person. I like to think when a patient walks in, what is the primary problem? So is there a sagging element? By that, I mean, is there looseness in the tissues? Is that the primary problem? So with time, eyelids drift inferiorly. And this is because there is laxity of the lateral and the medial campus. Now I have a theory. If you look at patients, and if you look at whether it's just an involutional case or post-operatively, there tends to be more scleral show in the lateral third than the medial third. So why is that? My thinking is that because the medial campus fixation is so much stronger than the lateral campus. And we'll come to that in a second. So you get an inferior displacement with time. So if you look at the fixation of the canthi, what you will notice is that the lateral campus is relatively long and really fixates only at two points, where it is said that the medial campus fixation is at nine points. So you tend to get laxity or lower lid retraction, more in the lateral than the medial third. And this is especially so even in post-op cases. If you look very carefully, it tends to be in the lateral third, even if you haven't removed any skin. So one of the things we do is we judge the snapback test. You pull the lid down, you forwards, and you see how long it takes to snap back. And clearly this lady has poor snapback due to the looseness of the tissue, the sagging element of her eyelid. The next way to look at it is, is there a drag element? So we have established that this could be due to saggy tissues, but also is there an element of the eyelid being pulled down? Now, again, we know that with time, most tissue planes descend and it includes the eyelid and the midface. So with time, there is a downward displacement of the entire lower eyelid with time. And this can be shown, especially if you ask the patient to look upwards, and if there's a cicatricial component also dragging it down, then it's more obvious when you look up and you open your mouth. So when I look at a lower eyelid, I'm thinking, is there a sag element or is this primarily a drag element or a combination of the two? And as we spoke, there is an involutional sag element and an involutional, which means age-related element of looseness and also pull down in most eyelids. The other category that has a sag element is the innovational category. So those who have paresis, palsy, weakness of the facial uh, nerve or the pretarsal orbicularis have a relative innovational sag. The orbicularis muscle, which is innovative with the facial nerve, is your only and most powerful lower eyelid elevator, especially the pretarsal and the preceptal components. But even the, the orbital component contributes when you have forced eyelid closure. So if you want your eyelid to be in the right position, you need good orbicularis function in this area. And here's just a, 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 a perioperative photograph that shows the neurovascular bundles arising from the inferior uh, orbital rim. So you see this, think of the lower eyelid musculature as a hammock, which is extremely strong and suspended at both ends. One, the lateral being slightly weaker than the medial and which is innervated from both ends. Uh, sometimes if you cut uh, the tissues in the medial campus, some of the nerves may be affected and you will see paresis of the medial third, even say in a DCR or any paranasal operations. So we see this often, uh, the inferior scleral show or uh, a retraction of the lower eyelid in paretic patients. The treatment for this, as we can't presently re-innovate the orbicularis sling, is horizontal reinforcement. So if I see a patient with primarily a sag, I'm thinking I must reinforce this horizontally. So when it comes to horizontal reinforcement, you can either shorten or tighten. So that's how I'm thinking. I'm thinking 
is this primarily a sag issue? And if it's very loose, do I shorten or simply tighten? Those are the things that you need to think through. So when it comes to shortening, we can do a wedge resection or we can do a tarsal strip. The wedge resection is used. And I have to say that I think it's a great tool for horizontal lid shortening. We have moved very much into tarsal strips, but a well-placed wedge resection with a subsidiary incision to hide and, and, and removing the anterior lamella, hiding it behind uh, a subsidiary incision is an excellent way of shortening the lower eyelid, which is loose. And sometimes you will run into problems with the tarsal strip, but this is a great operation, and one I use more and more. So the next is the tarsal strip. Now, I, because of the information I often get when I teach, uh, I'm asked to go through certain operations in slightly more detail. So uh, if you bear with me, I will go through some these four operations in slightly more detail. So the tarsal strip, a great tool uh, proposed and popularized by Rick Anderson, Salt Lake City, an oculoplastic surgeon. So one of the things about a tarsal strip is before you perform a tarsal strip, it's worth just drawing where the lateral orbital rim is and thinking of the distance from the canthal angle to the lateral orbital rim, because this distance varies a lot. And you cannot, if the distance is very far, cut the eyelid here and expect to stretch it all the way across to about two centimeters. It just doesn't work. So you have to have an assessment of the length of sort of fixation or pulling that you'll need to do to fixate into the orbital rim. So an incision made with the blade in the crow's feet, which is horizontal, an incision made through uh, the canthal expansion of the inferior portion, full thickness and make sure it's completely detached. Then here, what I'm doing is I'm bringing the lateral border onto the orbital rim. And I'm saying to myself, this is where it's going to be fixated. So which length will the tarsal strip be? So here is the cross crossing of the lower eyelid to the upper eyelid. I've drawn a little line because that is the length of the strip that I will need. So imagine if the orbital rim is back here, you will need to pull the lid right across, it just wouldn't work. So be careful, make sure you know the distance between the canthus and the lateral orbital rim. So then you split it in two, a point here. If you're splitting into two, you need the posterior lamella, you don't need the anterior, so keep more of the posterior, less of the anterior. Here's a thicker posterior lamella. Then you will need to take all the mucosal surface off, both at the back and also on the rim itself. And sometimes you can cut a bit of the rim if there are lots of glandular tissue. Then the edge is cut. Now I'm often asked, which stitch do you use? How do you place it? It really doesn't matter what stitch you use. You can use proline, nylon, ethibon, vicrol, it doesn't matter. But remember from the previous lectures, those of you who listened in the previous lecture, I always say when it comes to the canthus, the most important thing with canthal fixation is two points. Here I'm using a loop on a 6-0 proline. Is that you place the suture on the anterior surface of the lid and the posterior surface of the rim. Number one rule. Number two rule, wherever you place the stitch on the tarsal plate or the canthus of the lid, the fixation on the orbital rim has to be higher. If you follow those two things, it really doesn't matter what stitch you use. So I'm now I'm pulling it to see how it fits. It fits quite snugly with no space between the eye lid and the eyeball. So usually at this point, we form a canthal reforming suture with a six of vital going through the upper lid gray line and then pulling it through and going through the lower lid gray line and when you pull this loop through, it has two effect. One, it forms a sharp canthal angle, and two, it stops the overriding or the misplacement of the upper and lower eyelids. If you get it wrong, then the upper eyelid or the lower eyelid can ride more forwards or backwards. I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but occasionally when you do blepharoplasty, you may get the upper eyelid riding over the lower eyelid in that lateral third. That's because there's been misalignment in the AP direction. And here's a tar tarsal strip and an ectropion. So when you want to tighten the loose tissues, you can shorten it. And those are the two methods of shortening. 
Now, the only thing I would say about shortening is you need to be careful in the presence of negative orbital vector. What does that mean? When you have a bulgy eyelid and you tighten the lower eyelid excessively, what will happen is the eyelid will ride under and you will get a greater lower lid retraction. So this is called the fat belly tight belt syndrome. And this was volunteered by a colleague at Chelsea and Westminster, and I assure you it's not me. So when you tighten the belt in this situation, expecting the belt to ride up, what actually happens is the belly comes forward like the eyeball and the belt rides down. So now that he's had his belt tightened, his belly is more protuberant, but his eye, his eyelid or his belt has fallen a little bit. So just be careful. And this is what happens when you tighten too much. You will see that the short lower eyelid is too low and the longer upper eyelid comes arching down to meet the shorter lower eyelid. Is it possible to support a weakened, saggy lower eyelid without causing this? Yes, you can support without shortening. And these are the techniques to support without necessarily shortening. Bony fixation, transcanthal and canthoplication. So again, for those who've listened to this lecture, I apologize but I call this the arc. So you must fixate for most eyelids, unless you're deliberately bringing it down, which is very unusual to bring a lateral canthus downwards, you must fixate between these two points, which is the intercanthal line and the lateral ala through the lateral canthus to the orbital rim. So that is your arc in which you must fixate any canthal uh, apparatus. So, Again, it doesn't matter. Remember those two rules about the anterior posterior placement on the rim and the, uh, and the lid and the arc. As long as you follow those principles, you should get the canthus in the right position. So bony fixations tend to be at the lower end. We don't tend to bony fixate at the superior end. I mean, and where, how high depends on how high you wish to make it. There are many techniques, again, of doing this, but the key for bony refixation and this is done when you really want to elevate and fixate permanently, you will need to detach both the anterior and posterior limb of the lateral canthus. The anterior limb is relatively weak and which we detach a lot. The posterior limb is very well fixated. So in order to refixate the, the canthus permanently in a higher position, you will need to detach the anterior fixation and more important, the posterior fixation. Having done that, there are many techniques. At Chelsea, we tend to use the two -hole, drill hole technique and refixate again with the same principles. Here, I'm using a 4-0 proline, double-ended, but it's anterior eyelid canthal and posterior orbital rim. So the fixation was used in this technique where you have a lower eyelid displacement due to this patient who's had multiple operations, especially the ptosis correction, and the canthus is displaced downwards. So this is bony fixation on to the orbital rim in a slightly superior position. Now, the transcanthal, great operation. I think those of you listening have seen this before, and I, I forwarded a video of these operations for people to see, and they are welcome to download it from the organizers. But on this occasion, I'm not going to show any videos because all the videos uh, are available through the organizers, but the transcanthal canthopexy, really the initial uh, promoted by Sam Hamra is a really great tool. And this is usually at the superior border of the arc. So I'm gonna go through some photographs to show you what I do. So an incision made, always make this incision through the skin crease. Don't try to make it through the rim, although it's easier to access this area through an orbital inc uh, 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 an incision high up near the eyebrow, it really scars poorly. So it's good, better to go through the skin crease and migrate upwards. So that's the line, expose the orbital rim. I'm just drawing out the periosteum. And the key to this is the incision is made with an 11 blade in the lateral canthal angle and slightly inferiorly. And then having made the stab incision, the this is a fibroproline round body needle Again, it doesn't matter what you use, uh, but if you use a round body, it tends to uh, stick onto the periosteum stronger. It doesn't cheese wire. Well. 
The key is to go downwards. Make sure you get hold of the inferior cantal expansion. Initially downwards, and you rotate it to come upwards as deep as you can near the orbital rim without going through the conjunctiva. Do check that it hasn't gone through the conjunctiva. And then you should have a loop. And the purpose of the stab incision is to ensure that the loop goes through. That's all. There are people who say you don't need the loop incision. The problem is that then you're relying on the, the, the loop cheese wiring through. Otherwise, you'll see a little proline uh, in the lateral cantal angle. So once you've done that, remember again, the fixation has to be in the posterior orbital rim. Then you take your uh, shield out because you want to check without the shield if you've got a snug fit of the lid onto the eyeball. So what you do is you pull and you'll see it should go snug against the eyeball. So again, if you keep checking, make sure that it's high and posterior, and then you can uh, finish that operation. The counter application tends to be towards the inferior end. We use it mostly for aesthetic purposes. And I've shown you this again as a box suture. Again, uh, 6 proline being used here, anterior surface, of the cantal expansion of the lid, posterior surface of the orbital rim slightly higher, and you pull, and as you pull, you've got to watch that the eyelid is going backwards and upwards and against the eyeball. So when it comes to the sag element, which is either innovational or involutional, you need horizontal reinforcement, and you've got to think, do I want to shorten or do I want to tighten? And if you're doing a shortening, remember the negative orbital vector principle. So now we move on to drag. So drag, I really think when I look at the patient, is this primarily a mechanical issue here or is it a cicatricial issue? So for the mechanical issue, you really need to debulk whatever is there pulling the lid down. And so here's a patient uh, that uh, is part of the craniofacial service uh, and his lower eyelid is completely displaced. I'm just showing you this as a gross example and debulking helps to raise the lower eyelid in this area. But more often you will have situations like this. Now this is interesting in that I took out this pocket of malar edema and for six weeks she had a bulge. It lasted altogether in some degree for four months. And you will see that this is caused a lower lid retraction. But fortunately, after six months, things settle and the lower eyelid is, is higher. And that is because all the loose elements I had compensated for with a very tight transcantal cantopexy and also a navicularis muscle support. So this eyelid went back despite being hung down with a mechanical drag effect for four months. So mechanical drag you have to deal with the mechanics. You have to debulk on the whole. But most of us think of the lower lid retraction as a cicatricial issue. And this is what confronts us a lot of times. So when you're dealing with the cicatricial issue, the really the way to think is which lamella is affected. So first of all, the anterior lamella. And this is often short in some procedures uh, with acid burns, with things, uh, with trauma. So the anterior lamella shortage is the thing that confronts us most frequently with lower lid retraction. And this, I've shown you again, can be highlighted with opening the mouth and looking up. So what are your treatment options for anterior lamella shortage? So when a patient walks in, I'm thinking, how do I deal with this anterior lamella shortage? So I usually say to the trainees and the fellows, you have to think, do I elevate the whole lower eyelid mid face complex? So am I in a position to bring the whole thing up or should I dissociate the eyelid from the mid face? So they're both options. Now, if you're going to separate, it usually is a separation of the eyelid from, from the mid face. And the commonest, the most frequently performed uh, procedure here is in the form of a graft. These two dissociate the lower eyelid from the mid face. So we'll start with grafts, an extremely useful tool, especially if you have global cicatricial change as we do with burns. So when we have patients with burns, really it's very difficult to elevate 
So the best way to, is to dissociate the lower eyelid and place a graft. Now, I'm, most of you, are, may, I'm sure, are experts at grafts, but for those not, who are not, I'm going to quickly run through graft. So make a subcellular incision, make a blade incision, and make sure that you have the largest defect with complete laxity. When you have the size, you mark it out and you have a template. You get something slightly larger than your template. Then you get the graft. And the key here in the periorbiter, if you're going to graft, you need to thin. You cannot possibly thin it too much. I've never seen a graft that is too thin in this area. I've seen lots of thick grafts that will need to be uh, thinned again. So then you place it, you can use all sorts of techniques. I use a 7 0 running rapid with bolster sutures, uh, compression sutures. But so what you will get is an effect of correction of, in this case, a lower lid retraction and ectropion with graft. Now you see, despite me thin, thin, thinning, this area is still a little bit too thick and required when she had other procedures done, this bit, I thinned her again. You can't ever thin it too much. So the next we move on to flaps. So the most useful flap that I, I, I use, especially with a post blepharoplasty situation is the upper to lower lid flap. And so I'm, I'm, I apologize for those of you who are, uh, do this all the time. But again, the key to an upper to lower lid flap is this, that the point of rotation of the flap must be higher than a line drawn between the two canthi. So all flaps, all grafts contract. If you start at a higher position, as the flap contracts, it will contract upwards. If you bring your flap all the way down, then as it contracts, it will contract downwards. And that is the case for all flaps for the lower eyelid. I often see flaps constructed on the medial or the lateral side, and people wonder why the flap has not resulted in a upward lift of the lower eyelid. Well, that is because the base was too low. So if you have a medial flap, you need to be higher than that line. So that base of the flap has to be high and come down. And then when it contracts, it will contract up. Similarly, if you have a flap on the cheek here, that point, the base of the flap has to be higher than that point. If it's lower, when it contracts, it will pull the lid down. So here's, and if you, if you have enough skin and you do it well, it actually blends in really well. So for this patient who has lower lid retraction, post blepharoplasty, especially in the lateral third, fortunately, it's the lateral third because we can use more skin in the lateral than the medial third of the upper eyelid. So she's corrected and she has in situ a heteropalpable flap with other additive procedures. I get another patient with a similar outcome following an upper to lower eyelid HP flap. And if you have lack of tissue and volume, as in this patient, you can use, this is a Doppler contralateral supratrochlear flap placed into position. And you will see this is added both volume and also help to lift the lid up, which is impossible to lift. In fact, in these cases where there is total anterior lamella shortage all the way from the lid, all the way down to the chin. The, an attempt to raise this as a block without dissociating the lower eyelid from the mid face, in my opinion, will not work well. So better to say, okay, I'm going to separate the lid from the mid face, I'm not going to think of it as a composite and place, in this case, a one and a half to almost two centimeter of tissue there's no way you can bring two centimeters of tissue up from the cheek area. Even with a cervical facial advancement, I've seen them drop again. So it's better to dissociate in that situation. So in occasionally, we will, of course, elevate the whole block. And this is really something I've been taught by all my craniofacial colleagues. And, I, I, and this really uh, has been one of the great joys of working at Chelsea and Westminster with my colleagues. So. We have used osmotic expanders. I have to say on the whole, I don't think this is as great as people think it is, but I've tried this. I, I, I placed it both through the inferior approach, the gingival approach, and also a approach. 
I know that uh, in our small experience, it appears that going through a superior approach is preferable to uh, an inferior approach in terms of extrusion. But here's an implant being placed. And here's a case that was undertaken with osmotic expanders uh, following a lady who's had multiple procedures in her lower eyelid, multiple blepharoplasties. So, but mid-facial elevation can be thought of as supra or subperiosteal or multiplanar. The supraperiosteal relies on soft tissue only elevation and the tissue that really holds things in position is the orbicularis. And traditionally we use an orbicularis muscle flap, but I have to say I use this less and less. As long as you ensure that you have good hold of the orbicularis, you don't have to form a flap, but you do need to support the orbicularis superiorly. So here's some patients who've had such procedures and they work for relatively small lower limb displacements quite well. And of course you can go subperiosteal, but subperiosteal almost always involves a supraperiosteal element as well. And this is why we call it multiplanar. So there's an incision in the uh, periosteum. And why do we like a subperiosteal approach? Well, because it's relatively avascular. Uh, but what I've learned also from my colleagues is that if it's a subperiosteal elevation, you will need to detach the whole of the periosteum. So just making a cut in the periosteum is inadequate. You'll have to cut the bottom, you'll have to cut the inner aspect, you'll have to cut the outer aspect. Now, as ocular plastic surgeons, we are able to cut the, the superior, as you see here. I'm even happy to cut inferior through the gingiva. I'm even happy to, to isolate the infra, uh, temporal, uh, so infraorbital neurovascular bundle, but I'm very scared when detaching from the lateral aspect uh, around the zygomatic arch. And this is really uh, best done with your craniofacial colleague. So the next thing from the anterior lamella is the middle lamella. So this is actually uh, something that you, you will be confronted with if you perform lower eyelid blepharoplasty. So this is often the presentation for patients who've had lower eyelid blepharoplasty. And this is due to the fibrosis and contraction of the inferior retractor complex and the septum. So when you see lower eyelid post blepharoplasty syndrome, think, is this anterior lamella deficit and or middle lamella fibrosis? You may, I, if you do enough lower eyelid blepharoplasties, you will get cases of lower eyelid malposition. And if you have mild lower eyelid malposition, you can massage the patient I uh, sort of say to the patient, massage regularly, and you will see a reversal of the malposition. Now, if you had true lower eyelid deficit, uh, sorry, antilamella deficit, this would not occur. How can you add skin by simply massaging? Well, I think that the majority of these cases is a combination of failure to address the looseness, the laxity horizontally, but also middle lamella fibrosis. So that is why mild lower lid retraction or even eversion will return to its normal position with massage because in time, the middle lamella will stretch. Now, if you have that, you can actually also inject with anti-metabolites, which I'll talk to you about later, uh, in addition to massaging. Now, I'm not sure why this is not showing me in my picture. That sometimes seems okay. So if you're going to address this malposition as a consequence of lower blepharoplasty performed transcutaneously, it's best to reapproach this transconjunctively. You don't want to open the scar tissue again. You don't want to call eversion again. So transconjunctival approach is preferred for middle lamella fibrosis. So the key is complete separation of all the fibrotic tissue planes. Again, I seem to be getting stuck. So here you will see the huge amount of scarring that I found, which I'm separating. And so when you come to separating, you need to really ensure that all the scars are rid of to the point where this scissor here point is almost through the skin. 
you have to make sure that it's completely loose at every level with a frost stitch. When you see your lid is being stretched superiorly without too much pull, then you know you've broken all the scar elements. I apologize, I don't know why this keeps happening, but uh, let's see if we can go back, okay. So when you've done that, it'll cause a lot of bleeding and you may need to put a, a adrenaline soap patty inside for a while and, and compress it because it will bleed a lot so, sometimes for five to 10 minutes because you'll not be able to staunch. And you don't want to cauterize too much again because you'll cause re-scarring in this area. So when you have the situation and you're not putting in more antilamella, what is the effect? So you will see that this is a week post-surgery. And here I perform uh, separation of the scars transconjunctively, a tarsorophy and a frost and a pad on the right side overnight. On the left side, I actually put the pad on for four days. And here's the left side, which I've been much more aggressive with. So what about anti-metabolites? Well, you can use steroids, but I usually use 5-FU. You can get vials of 5-FU in 50 milligrams. So if you had a 50 milligram, you ask your pharmacy for 50 milligrams of 5-FU, dissolve it in saline for injection, two mils, and then I use 20 to 25 milligrams, so one mil, 25 milligrams, on each side. And through the transconjunctival incision, I will inject at many spots the injection of 5-FU. Now, you can also inject depomedrone. Now, depomedrone is a particulate agent. So as an ophthalmologist, we have encountered central retinal vein, artery occlusion with injections of depomedrone. So I'm scared. So what I usually do, because it's a chalky material, is I will put it in a syringe and I will spray it rather than inject it all over the scarred area through the conjunctival incision. So a combination of injection of 5-FU and spray of depomedrone. And then it's really worth putting the frost holding the lid up and taping the frost onto the forehead overnight on the lesser side and three to four days on the other side. I will also perform a suture tarsorophy. By that I mean going in with a fiber vicral, coming out of the, of the gray line, going in through the gray line, out and in. I don't usually use any rubber bungs or plastic bits. I just put a stitch in. And what I think that does is holds the lid up, but also every time the person opens their eye, the upper eyelid pulls on the lower eyelid. So it gives me traction during the time of secondary uh, lamella uh, fibrin deposition. So here's again, the effect of this without adding skin, you'll see it's an acceptable result. Not perfect. She has a two to three meter sclerosha. Sometimes you will have this situation uh, in long-standing cases and also in paralytic cases. By that I mean, if you operate and you operate and you operate over and over again, trying to correct something, you will slowly paralyze the pretarsal and the preceptal obicularis. And that, then you've added another dimension of lower lid retraction etiology. So you need to be careful not going in too many times in patients who have lid malposition. And also thinking back and going, through a conjunctival approach. But if you have that situation, then not only will you need to go through the conjunctival and do what I've just shown you, but you might need to support the mid face onto the bone. And this, there are many techniques of you. I know some people use endotene, some people use mitex, some people just simply suture or drill hole into the orbital rim. But occasionally you will need to support the mid facial tissues along with what I've shown you in terms of separating the scar. What about posterior lamella shortage? Now this isolated posterior lamella shortage is extremely rare. We see it occasionally as ophthalmologists in cicatricial uh, scarring diseases of the conjunctiva, occasionally with acid or alkali being thrown, but this usually results in an entropion. If you have a true entropion, this is be best dealt with uh, by an oculoplastic surgeon uh, because it really needs augmentation only of the posterior lamella. So if you have a shortage, you can think, do I put a graft or do I put a flap? Well, let me talk about flaps of the posterior lamella. What I would say is that I have never used a flap from the upper eyelid to the lower eyelid 
to reconstruct an aesthetic issue because the lower eyelid is completely expendable, the upper eyelid is not. If you do something to the lower eye, upper eyelid to, to reconstruct a lower eyelid aesthetically and you run into problems with the upper eyelid, you're in big trouble. Then you have a retracted lower eyelid and a retracted upper eyelid because you've used a flap. And that will definitely lead to problems. So for me, aesthetic reconstruction of the lower eyelid, aesthetic reposition of the, a retracted lower eyelid should never involve a flap from the upper eyelid. Grafts are the way to go. Now, again, this is a personal preference. I usually use the cheek. I know that some people prefer um, to use uh, the lip. I don't think you get a big enough uh, tissue, but that's a possibility for uh, small grafts. For me, the posterior lamella is really a lining. It is not a support. So when I place something into the posterior lamella, like uh, this buccal mucosa, I'm thinning it to translucency because I'm actually wanting lining. I'm not wanting support. I don't think the posterior lamella contributes to the support. I know that some people use hard palate. So in 20 years, I've used the hard palate once for a particular reason. But uh, if you use a hard palate, I think if you consider switching to a soft buccal mucosa, it will be just as good. I know people say it gives support, but I don't think it does. I think the support comes from horizontal strengthening because most people, when they put a hard palate, will also tighten it horizontally. A true support for the lower eyelid will require, as I showed the conical graft, support has to rest on the orbital rim to elevate. If you just put a big chunk of tissue on the posterior lamella without support horizontally or as a support on the rim, then for sure that weight will cause it to drop. But in some situations you will need to use it. And if you find that this is a successful technique for you, go ahead. But just once try not using it and using buccal mucosa. So when it comes to lower eyelid retraction, the way I think is, is this true or pseudo? If it's a true global rather than a focal lower lid retraction, is there a sag element? Is it just involutional? Is it an innovational issue? If it's a drag element, is there mechanical? For the sag element, I'm really thinking primarily horizontal reinforcement. Remember I said you can shorten or tighten. We went through the operations. For the drag, is it a mechanical or a cicatricial issue? And we're thinking of vertical augmentation, whether we add and you think of the lamella and you think, do I dissociate or elevate as a composite? So that's how I think of the process. So I hope this gives you an idea of how I'm thinking. Uh, so this is what I call my management. It is not the management. I am sure there are those who are listening in who are much more expert at this and they have their way of thinking. But this is just to give you a very opinionated one person's management of lower eyelid malposition or lower eyelid retraction. So stick to your management if it works, but have a way of thinking. So presenting a lecture makes you think, why is it that uh, I'm doing what I'm doing? How, do I, how, am I, how am I thinking? So as I said, my attempt at lid elevation over the years has been moderately successful, I have to say, uh, and I've been pleased with the way I've thought uh, but sag and drag affects all of us uh, and includes me. And let me just, unfortunately, this is what happens when you try to show you a funny slide. So for those of you who, who met me in my youth, you, you, you've met me in my uh, normal height. But what has happened to me over the years is I've shrunk a little bit and that's the height that I'm at now. So sag has sadly affected me considerably. Well, thank you very much. I think I've, I've got about 10 minutes left. I hope that was useful to some of you. Um, so I'm gonna say a happy holidays, uh, goodbye to 2020, which was supposed to be such great for us ophthalmologists and uh, goodbye to Mr. COVID and see you in, in person sometime soon. And those of you uh, who are oculoplastic surgeons, I hope we'll meet in person in, in Dubai in 2022, a full two years ahead.
a oh, year and a half ahead. Again, thank you very much. Thank you, Naresh. That was a wonderful Thank lecture. you, Naresh. That was great. Really um, uh, well thought out, and clear and interesting lecture. Um, now, we've got a few questions on our chat board at the moment. Um, can I ask you initially, what, what's your favourite um, skin for, for lower lid skin grafts? Where would you harvest it from preferentially? Sure. Uh, for sure, the upper lid is the best source, but that's not always possible. They're large enough. Then pre-auricular or post-auricular because they match better. Uh, and depending on the, you know how much uh, sunburn there is to the pre-auricular, then it's a post-auricular, and then it's supraclavicular. And often for very large grafts, I use uh, the underarm area, uh, which is also very useful. I know we've used the pubic area. Uh, those are the kind of areas. So you can go from upper lid, pre, post, uh, supraclavicular, arm, uh, and, uh, and the pubic area. But the key so for me in the graph sorry, oh, sorry. Is, is, is to thin it. Sorry. You really can't thin it enough. So, and also it's very difficult to thin the edges. So if you oversize your graph, you thin, 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 yeah. and put out the edge because the edge is always what uh, looks a bit thick. Go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, so a question from when you were uh, dissecting your lower lid and putting a frost suture in um, uh, there's been a question do you ever put a bandage contact lens in um, there's a question about the, the frost suture um, touching the cornea okay so it shouldn't and it's a good question firstly my frost suture comes out through the gray line so it shouldn't but when you come to put the frost this is a technique that we sort of use at Chelsea a lot so what you do use is I don't know if you have Vaseline gauze or, or you, you, paraffin gauze. If you have those, I don't know whoever asked the question. If you have such a gauze, what you do is that you place a folded gauze with the upper eyelid closed on the uh, upper eyelid. Then you bring your frost over the gauze and tape it on the forehead. Then I put more gauze on top. So it stops. It, uh, it really, on the whole, riding on the um, upper eyelid skin it tends not to go on the cornea unless, I suppose, if you open the cornea. I don't use a, a bandage contact lens, uh, but there's no reason why you shouldn't, especially if you're frosting for a day or so. Sometimes you'll need to frost for a full, you know, three or four days, because as my old colleague used to say, the fibrin matrix is laid down in the first 24 to 48 hours. And if you have the eyelid on stretch for 48 hours, then the fibrin that is laid down is in a stretch position. So the scarring will occur in a stretch position. That's what we're trying to stimulate. Okay. Um, and there's, uh, Sajid has asked a question about the conjunctival sutures you use, how you stop those abrading the um, cornea whilst the lid is on retraction. Uh, of, the, uh, of the buccal mucosa? Uh, yes. Okay, so that is a time when so, you yes. use a large bandage contact lens. So we have uh, very large bandage contact lenses and you can do use, use that uh, because that, of course, will, especially if, if the, the conjunctival sutures are very high up. So normally, if you have any mu mucosal surface, you want to make your incision relatively low so that any uh, sutures that you place are well below where the inferior corneal limbus is. So if you uh, you know, don't make your incision. You should never make your incision uh, anywhere uh, on the tarsus. I mean, it has to be subtarsal. But if you are worried that your sutures are close to the limbus uh, and you haven't placed them in for the fornix, then, then you can use a bandage contact lens for sure. But try to go subtarsal as we would for most incisions. Great, thank you. Um, so Amin has asked, what's your protocol for massage? How long do you do it for? How do you do it? How often? And, and um, what do you recommend they use? Okay, so massage is almost like a, one of those things that you, uh, you know, get the patients to participate in their care. I, I, I never know how much is good enough, how strong it is. So I usually say for the patients that have lower lid retraction, so they have to use 
their fingers, make sure they don't use a straight finger because their fingernail could go in. So usually with a curved finger, they have to go on the outer, the center, and the medial. They have to do it. Now I have this thing to make it easy for patients. I usually say a minimum of four times a day for four minutes each time. Now, I don't know if that makes any sense, but it's easy for them to remember. When I say use cold compresses, I say minimum of four times for four minutes each time. It's just a way of making them participate in massaging. But uh, massage, I think, gets you there a bit quicker, but you probably will get there in, in any way. But maybe early on, it helps to stretch the, the, the fibro matrix. And do you use any kind of cream or lubricant while they massage? Okay, so for in terms of hydration, I always say to the patient, there are two types of hydration. One is, uh, and hydration is very important for wound healing. And that's why people use silicon, et cetera. That's the principle of, uh, of wound healing. So hydration is in two types. You are either putting stuff in, which is aqueous based. So you can hydrate during the day with aqueous based compounds. You can use uh, aqueous cream, which is super cheap and in huge vats, which is what I've used. Or you can use, I don't know, creme de la mer, a thousand pounds, but anything that puts in water hydrates. And the other way to hydrate is with a barrier cream. The simplest barrier cream is Vaseline. But of course, people also use silicon. Silicon also is a barrier to dehydration. So when you think of massage and hydration, you think you're putting in water with aqueous based compound. You're stopping water evaporating with barrier like Vaseline. So I usually say you can use whatever, but think of those two principles. Putting in water daytime, stopping dehydration at nighttime because you don't want to walk around with Vaseline all over your eyelids. Lovely. Um, Arda has asked, do you use a frost suture or tar in every lower lid blepharoplasty case? No, uh, I use a frost suture while I'm operating, but I don't leave a frost afterwards. Now, that's a very interesting question about the tar If I'm performing a upper and lower eyelid blepharoplasty, and I'm worried about chemosis, if the patient is diabetic, hypertensive, smoker, and even on table as you're operating, you'll see a little bit of chemosis starting to happen. I will put in a temporary tarsography with a stitch on the lateral third. So if you put a stitch, a fibrovical, through the skin of the upper eyelid, out the uh, gray line, through the gray line of the lower eyelid, out the skin, and back on yourself with a, a stitch, it will help greatly with chemosis because chemosis is your major pain when you have it bad because it can cause malposition. And I have a patient right now uh, who has a delin, uh, and a delin, by the way, for those not in the ophthalmic world means if you have so much chemosis, the cornea adjacent to the chemosis is not hydrated by the blinking of the eyelid, it gets very dry, it gets compacted and it gets abraded. And I'm worried that she'll get infected. I've drained it twice and she's got it again. She had a four lip blepharoplasty. I'm not sure why, she's a big smoker, but I'm not sure why that's, so I've done a temporary tarsography on one side. I wish I'd done it at the time of the operation. So it's worth doing frost only for reconstructive redos. I would put that in, but the frost during the operation I always use for traction. Thank you. Um, so Tristan McMullen has asked, have you tried recessing the skin in anterior lamellar shortage and then put it on lid traction, and leaving it to granulate? This is very interesting because I first heard of this in um, uh, at a lecture. My, my problem was the person who showed me two cases, I felt hadn't really done enough for long enough. Now, the way we think is that if you have not enough skin, and you then make another cut and you put it on traction, logically, it wouldn't work. I, I mean, I, I, it shouldn't work because the skin will recontract. But I suppose you could try uh, because we don't want to put a skin graft for aesthetic purposes. I've never done it myself um, to make an incision and separate the anterior lamella and see if it granulates. But I suppose you'd have to keep it on traction for a long time, ask them to massage, and it might have secondary intention healing. I suppose that's possible, but it's not something I've done. But I have seen that presented, but I didn't think that the person presenting it had done enough cases 
and had shown pictures six months to two years later. The pictures that were shown were about six weeks later, which I felt wasn't long enough. But I mean, but if it works in your practice, that's great, but I haven't done it myself. There's just a, a couple of questions about the use of 5-FU. Yeah. Um, have you had any side, uh, side effects from 5-FU, such as a hyperpigmentation? And, and how often would you use it? Would you repeat the procedure and at what interval? Okay, so firstly, the 5-FU is given transconjunctivity deep into the tissue, so I have not had a hyperpigmentation. The 5-FU on the whole, because it's uh, done in uh, thick tissue deep inside, I don't think it's an issue. And the, and the dosage we are using is so relatively small in a big uh, area, because those who use 5-FU and mitomycin for conjunctival surgery, uh, you know, are experienced in it, and I don't think it's an issue. In terms of how frequently I use it, so the, what is said you should do it, you should do it for at least three weeks, and you should do it intraoperatively one week later and two weeks later. You can do it, the, if you didn't, if you still feel a lot of tension, you can do it week four, but you, probably three injections, intraoperative, week later, two weeks later, should suffice for most people. But then you'll and have you're to- And you're going through the either, conge for each? Well, no, you can go through the skin, but really I've okay. not had hyperpigmentation, but you need to go relatively deep. Thank you. Um, and then Tristan has asked about 5-FU. Are there any worries in fertile females? Oh, God. Tristan, you'd ask me difficult questions. My goodness, I suppose you better ask them if they're fertile. <laughs> but, uh, I suppose. No, I, uh, um, I, be, um, I, I haven't asked that question. And I'm just trying to think if I had any fertile females come back to me for their 5-FU injections. But I don't know is the answer, but I suppose it, it, it might have a an effect, but no, I have not uh, asked that question, Tristan. I shall make sure that I put that in my consent form next time. Um, Alexandra has asked, um, what's your opinion and experience with dermal fat grafts um, or free fat grafts for volume replacement in, the, in lower eyelid retraction? Uh, fat grafts? Again, I mean, you'd have to think of the lamellae. And yeah. Yeah. In what situation would you put fat grafts? Yeah, sorry, dermal fat grafts or free fat grafts uh, in uh, lower eyelid retraction. I suppose you need, need to think of the lamella you're trying to address. Push up. So, so, so you'd only probably be able to do that in the absence of posterior anterior lamella deficit for middle lamella fibrosis, I suppose. I think then you could probably use anything. I know that people use uh, hyaluronic acid to say that the eyelid goes up. I'm not entirely convinced. I have no experience in using fat grafting to lift an eyelid up. I, I, I have not used that uh, because as I say, for the middle lamella fibrosis, which I think that would be useful for, uh, I usually use uh, an, a surgical plus 5-FU technique. But I mean, if it works, as I say, this is, you know, why not? And then question from Sharon, uh, when do you perform inferior retractor accession, just dropping the inferior retractors, or do you use it? No, uh, I mean, by default, when you go through the transconge and you separate the conge, it, it has that effect. When you do a uh, transconge type of blepharoplasty, it has that effect. Uh, and that's why sometimes you'll see the conge, the eyelid rise a little bit in transconge type of blepharoplasty in some patients. Uh, but I don't use it as a tool for, um, I mean, uh, sorry, I use it uh, by accident, I suppose. I'm not deliberately recessing it, but when I cut the inferior retract to the transconjunctival approach for retraction, that has that effect. Yeah, you'd, you'd never use it as a standalone for inferior uh, lid retraction, um, maybe with some tightening. Uh, you mean just cutting the posterior conjunctiva? Uh, and dropping the retractors. Okay, as I say, if you cut the conjunctiva and you separate with your scissors, by default, that is a, re a retractor recession. Okay. Um, Andra has asked, what will be your first option of reconstruction in Burns cases with anterior, middle and posterior lamella retraction? Oh my goodness. So usually <laughs> anterior, posterior, middle and... So usually it's anterior. I mean, it's very unusual to get posterior lamella contraction at the same time, uh, unless it's acid, uh, because most people close their eyes reflexively uh, 
when there's a burn and they burn their anterior lamella. I've uh, very rarely seen pan lamella. Usually that causes a total necrosis. So you have to use a flap. So I have seen where people have complete necrosis of all the tissues, then you need to use a flap. And sometimes you use a forehead flap. Fortunately, if they have a forehead, or that you can use a forehead flap with buccal mucosal lining. That's what you would use for pan lamella uh, deficit. So you need to reconstruct the both the anterior, middle, and posterior lamella. You can actually use buccal mucosal on the flap at the same sitting and put it on. Thank you. Um, and Eamon has asked, how do you differentiate middle lamella attraction by physical examination? Okay, so if it's purely an anterior, you'll see an element of ectropion. The middle lamella, you can push the lid upwards. Uh, and in the, if you see that the skin is not too tight and there isn't an eversion as you push up, it's probably middle lamella fibrosis. But it's, I know there are people who say you can do this and that, but I'm not convinced. But for me, if I ask them to open the mouth and look upwards and there isn't a drag down, but there's still a downward vector, then I suppose it's a middle lamella fibrosis because posterior lamella fibrosis is so unusual in post-operative cases. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's the most question. I'm sorry if, if I've missed anything. Um, I know you're, you're going out for, for dinner tonight, so we don't want to, to keep you too long, but thank you so much. Um, <laughs> Oh, you've already got a drink of wine. Thank you so much for, for the lecture tonight. It's been it's been wonderful, um, as usual. I'm going to wear my Christmas hat oh. and wish everyone a happy holiday. And uh, thank you for listening to me. But if you have any questions, most of you know me, so you can ping me a message. But I'm very happy. All through the, the organisers, I'm happy to do that too. I, I echo what Sarah said, Neresh. Thank you so much for this lecture and also for the series that you've given us. We are we're a step by step. We're truly grateful and we, we love yes. working with you. So. Thank you so much. And uh, as Sarah said, we'll let you go off and enjoy your your thank you with your family before this third tier comes into effect. Take care, everybody. And I'd like to thank all, all everyone who's uh, tuned in. And I'd like to thank, I'm sure, those of you I work with. Uh, I, I'm grateful for you teaching me so much uh, and through my career. And most of this, what I've said, is as a consequence of all you guys helping me to learn so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Naresh. So what I'll do, I'll leave the chat on running for the next five minutes or so, so people can put their feedback on there and I'll send it to you, Naresh. Sure. Um, otherwise, I um, hope everyone has a great Christmas, a relaxing uh, festive period and, uh, and a hopefully a better 2021 than we've had uh, 2020. And, uh, yes. and stay, stay healthy and stay fit. As I said, check the website out. There'll be a link to catch up for Naresh's lecture later on tonight. And also, Naresh, if I can put your, I'll put your surgical videos back on then. Yeah, sure, sure. Anyone can have the video. And I've got more videos if, uh, which I'll send to you if people. Okay. Yeah, happy to upload those to the website, and people can can um, check out the links on there. Okay. Otherwise, good evening, everybody, and thank you, Sarah, for sharing. Uh, thank my... you, Sarah. See you. Take care. Bye bye. <laughs>